Yeah, you can do that except that in that case the time at which you are calculating the correlation function like the t, small t1, small t2, those will also be shifted to infinity. Right? Right. Yeah, you, of course the whole thing is time transition invariant but it's not very convenient, right? Because you want the final arguments which appear in your correlation function, you want those to be finite. See, otherwise in the uh, argument when you write gx1, x2, right? The ti's will be all infinite, right? Because you have shifted them by capital T and then you have taken capital T to infinity. Yes. Right? So that's not a very convenient notation. Right? So you want the function where the arguments of the function will remain fixed as you are taking the limit. Right? And for that it's best to take from minus C to T. Right? Take the uh, uh, actual uh, uh, physical operators whose expectation value you are trying to calculate. Those at finite time. And then take capital T to infinity. Then, but of course the whole thing is time transition invariant, right? So you can always shift the whole thing by some amount. Because after all, you the factors which appeared, right? Well like this. E to the minus say, small t minus capital T or things of that, that form, right? So if you take capital T finite and small t to infinity, you have exactly the same effect. Correlation function. Yes. Suppose I have to calculate some uh, state vectors after time t, after uh, very large time. Yes. So that time would it be same? Yeah, the state vector will evolve by e to the i h t, right? Which is Hamiltonian. Okay. And then, uh, I mean, it, de it will depend on the difference in time. If we fix the initial state, yes. right? Then after a certain time, what it becomes depends on the time difference that that is elapsed. Yeah, so I can take this initial time not minus, some minus t at some positive t. Yes. And then later time, how does it involve that depends on i, h, t. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, because it always depends on the difference in times. Yes. Right? Because the whole thing is time transition in right? <coughs> Are there other questions? No, sir. Uh, my doubt was if uh, h was time dependent. No, we are not considering H which to be time dependent. For the state vectors after time t. If H depends, H depends on time, right? Then of course the whole uh, time process in Paris breaks down, yes. right? Then it will depend on where you begin, yes. okay. right? So you are not considering the case of time dependent H, mm -hmm. right? In the Heisenberg picture, H you are taking to be time independent. Yes. Is this so that in fact I have been saying from the beginning itself that we are not right now considering time dependent age. Okay. So last time we left with this uh, question of whether the combinatorial factors factorize. Right. So let me uh, state the problem. So basically imagine that you have a diagram which has a connected component. It okay, doesn't matter what diagram it is, a connected component and a diagram which is a bubble. So connected here means that this part of the diagram is connected to at least one or more external line. Right? Every uh, vertex is connected to at least one or more external lines. Okay? Doesn't mean that the whole diagram has to be connected. It could be something like this for example. Okay, This also will be included in this. And this is bubble which has no external line. And let's suppose that we have m vertices here, m vertices here, and n vertices here. Then the contribution from this combined diagram will be like 1 over n plus n factorial that comes from the exponential, expanding the exponential times some combinatory factor. <coughs> now, 
Now we want to com compare this. We want to compare this with a product of two terms. Okay, the same diagram that appeared here times the bubble. The same diagram that appeared here. Okay. But now you are thinking of this as a separate diagram. This as a separate diagram and taking the product. Okay. So here <coughs> to count, so it's the same diagram. So you have m vertices here. M vertices. Where is n vertices? So here the we will do this calculation is that this diagram will give 1 over m factorial times combinatorial factor <coughs> this diagram will give you 1 over n factorial times combinatorial factor And then you just take the product. Okay. And the question is, is this the same as this? Okay, is the difference here? Here you are calculating two diagrams separately and taking the product. Here we have taken the, the one diagram as a whole and calculating it. Okay. Now the reason that these are the important factors is because it should be clear that the rest of the factors are the same. Right? Feynman rules that you will use for calculating this diagram and the product are identical. Right? You will get same to be minus i lambda over 4 factorial to some power, <coughs> some uh, integrals and so on. So this is what you want to compare and the idea is that if this is, happens to be true, okay, then we can show that the bubble diagrams factorize. Right? That sum of our Feynman diagrams like this can be thought of as sum of our Feynman diagrams like this plus times sum of Feynman diagrams like this. Okay, and then that will cancel with the denominator. <coughs> so this, to see this, okay, it's actually not very hard, but you have to just count the combinatorial factor in a certain way. Okay. So so far the way you have been counting the combinatorial factor, is we take the collection of all vertices, okay, take one external line, and first decide how many ways it can connect. Okay. Then you take the second one, decide how many ways it can connect, and at the end after you have exhausted all the external lines, then we take the internal lines and try to connect them to each other. Okay. But of course, you can count it in many different other ways also. Right? There is no unique way of counting combinatory factors, because the results should be the same. So now it turns out that to analyze this diagram, it's easier to count the combinatory factor in the following order. Okay. That first, we have here m plus n vortex. Right? m vertex from here, n vertex from here, so m plus n vertex. So we have expanded the exponential, you have m plus n uh, vertex factors. Okay. So the first we decide okay, that of this m plus n vertices, which are part of this and which are part of this. Right? If we take one vertex which is here and one vertex which is here and exchange them, they would have been counted differently in the first two of doing the counting, right? Because we take, for example, when we had the five, this diagram, for example. Right? The first factor that we took was eight, right? Because this line could have connected to other four of, these are four of these. But if you had decided from beforehand that this will correspond to the first vertex, this will be the second vertex, then that factor wouldn't have been there. Right? That would be a different way of doing the counting. So first we decide that of the m plus n vertices, how many goes here, which ones go here, and which ones go there. So how many such ways are there? M plus N C N. So it will be M plus N C N. Okay. Once you have made this choice, okay, that you have taken some M M of these and put them here, N of them and put them here. Okay, we have not said yet how those M are distributed here. Okay, just which m is what you have decided. Then you can easily convince yourself that after that the counting of the combinatorial factors here is identical to the counting of the combinatorial factors here and here. 
Okay, because already I have assigned m vertices here, n vertices there. Okay. And then you are just trying to connect external lines in all possible ways. Okay. That counting is the same here as well as here. Right? For every way of con connecting here and here, you will find a corresponding way of connecting here and here. Is that point clear? So this is then the only factor that is excess. Yeah, and this commutatory factor is basically this times the product of the commutatory factors here. Okay, because for every possible way, way here and every possible way here, there is a corresponding way in this and vice versa. So this basically establishes the equality because if you take that, so this is m plus n factorial over m factorial times n factorial. Okay. So if you take the product, the m plus n factorial cancels out and you are left with 1 over m factorial times 1 over n factorial, which is exactly what we have here. Is this argument here? Okay. So what? You have to just convince yourself that once we have decided that m vertex goes here and n vertex goes there. Then for every possible way of connecting things here, there is a possible way of connecting things here times a possible way of connecting things here. <coughs> okay, because the, the topology of the diagrams is exactly identical in these two cases. <coughs> yes, it would be true if, if we replace the bubble with another connected one. As long as if we just have two structures, right, and you have separated it out, okay, then the argument is going to be identical. <coughs> okay, any questions? So, so basically, when we are not allowing to exchange any values between these, these two diagrams, that's right. That is, then they are basically using independent. Exactly. Then they are basically using independent count. Exactly. <coughs> so next, we will try to. Learn about momentum space range functions. Okay, we had defined gx1 to xn. But if you remember the connection between the Green's function and the S matrix, okay, S matrix naturally uses the Fourier transforms of these, right? Which is a momentum space range function. So we define g tilde k1 to kn as integral d4 x1 d4 xn Now, of course, since we have given the Feynman rules for calculating this, okay, we should take those Feynman rules and try to derive the expressions for these in terms of Feynman diagrams. <coughs> but what we will do is a is something a little different. Okay, we will try to derive Feynman rules directly for these. Okay. For phi four theory, of course, it makes no difference because we have already given the Feynman rules for in the X space, so you can have worked them out. But it turns out that it's um, uh, useful to understand how to derive these Feynman rules directly in momentum space, because later on when you consider more general theories, okay, we try to write down the Feynman rules directly in momentum space, okay, not in the position space. So we'll see in the phi four theory how we can write down the Feynman rules directly in the momentum space, okay, without having to go through this g x one x two x n. So let me write down the reverse relation also. So g x one to x n. To Excel will be given by <coughs> d4 k1 by 
if I to be cold. So knowing this, we know that this is given by integral d5 <coughs> dy is of phi, phi of x1 <coughs> to phi of xn divided by z0. Okay, so z0 is just the same thing though. This. So this allows us to write g tilde p1 to pn. As one over z zero, I feel like it is a definition. Integral. So the idea now is that we will try to convert these integrals. This was a path integral over phi. This was the action written in terms of phi. We will try to convert change variables and rewrite them in terms of phi tilde. Because then we can do this integral easily just by forgetting about phi altogether and working with phi tilde exactly. Okay. So we will try to rewrite these and these in terms of phi tilde. Yes. No, not necessarily. A of phi, I have not said anything so far. Okay. Okay. So it's not free field theory. This is just a Fourier transform. Okay. So this is true for free as well as interacting theories. <coughs> so G, the expression for G tilde, yes. now is a claim or? No, this is not a claim. This follows from this definition because. I use this, okay. I took gx1 to xn, that is this expression, okay. I substitute it here, okay. and then the integral over xs of course can be taken inside, right? because xs are just levels. So by okay. taking this inside, I just convert this phi to phi tilde. Okay. So this follows from the definition of g, original definition of g as well as the definition of the Fourier transform. Okay. So this is not something that this is not a new postulate, okay? this is not what I have already said. Okay. So to do this calculation, let us try to rewrite everything in terms of phi tilde. So s of phi, this was minus half integral d4x to the So this I can write as minus half <coughs> of 
Okay, I'll put this i epsilon here itself. As I said, there are many ways of introducing this i epsilon. One way is just simply changing m square to m square minus i epsilon, right? That's the easiest to do. Okay, otherwise, you have to do the scaling of the time axis and all. So I just replace m square by m square minus i epsilon. Right? Uh, is this obvious to everybody that this is the same as this? Right? All you have to do is have to write phi of x in terms of phi tilde of k. So this can be inverted, right? This gives phi of x as integral d4 k to 1 to pi to the 4 to the power. So basically, you substitute phi of x in terms of phi tilde k in uh, both of these. Right? The, these derivatives will just bring down the factors of k, k mu, okay, and then just put things together, and this is what you'll get. Okay? And eventually, of course, you have to do the x integral using the standard identity, the d4x into the ik dot x is 2 pi to the 4 uh, delta, right? Delta 4 of k. So you have to use use <coughs> integral d4x to the power i k dot x as 2 pi to the 4 delta 4 of k. Okay, so this is what gives rise to this delta function over here. Okay. Here there are two integrals. Okay, I could have also written it as two integrals. Okay. But then there will be a delta function. Okay, so this is the this I can also write as integral d4 k1 by 2 pi to the 4, 4 k2 by 2 pi to the 4, <coughs> times this of course, k1 square plus n square. Okay, so this, the reason that this becomes minus k and k is because to begin with you have an integral of this form. Okay, and then you can do this integral, you can do one of this k, k2 integrals. Right? That sets k2 equal to minus k1 because of this delta function. And that's what leads to this expression of that. So this is a straightforward evaluation of the x integral after you substitute. Other questions? <coughs> Similarly, if you have this integral d four x phi x j x so this is integral d4 k phi j tilde minus k <coughs> tilde of k d4 k over 2 by 2 so again you do it in two steps and you get this expression. So because of this form, we can write g tilde k1 to n as the 
Let me put the I here. Okay, because the Z. I just multiply this by I because we had inserted in the action an I integral function. <coughs> Is this point clear? So ZJ will have this term in the exponent, right? In the definition of ZJ, right, you have this path integral, maybe I can write it once. <coughs> minus 2 pi to the 4 <coughs> i delta delta j tilde minus k. Okay. Each such derivative when acts on this, when it acts on this, it acts on the exponent and brings down a factor. <coughs> because you are defining such so j tilde minus k, so it brings down a factor of phi to the phi tilde of k. Okay. This 1 over 2 pi to the 4 gets cancelled against this 2 pi to the 4 and the minus sign gets cancelled against that side. Okay. So the idea is that if we can calculate zj and give the result in terms of J tilde instead of J. Okay, we can just differentiate and uh, calculate what the uh, the moment of space range functions are. Again, at this stage, you could have just taken the expression for Z J that you have already derived in the position space, and then converted it to the uh, in terms of J tilde. Right? Because j and j tilde are simply related, right? That's a Fourier transform. Okay. But we will try to evaluate zj directly. Okay. Again, keeping in mind that later on, okay, when the kinetic term is not so simple, for example, when it is not just a scalar field theory, okay, it will be useful to directly learn how to calculate zj in terms of j tilde okay, without going through the position space representation. So you have already learned how to write this one in terms of phi tilde. Okay, this is already written in terms of phi tilde. So only thing that remains is that this was an integral over phi. Right? We have to think of this as a path integral over phi tilde. Okay, if we can do that, then we can forget about phi altogether and what just with phi tilde. Okay. So the question is. Can we convert phi to phi tilde? The integral of what? d phi to integral of what? d phi tilde. Okay. So to do that, of course, you have to first learn what we mean by integral d phi tilde. Right? And this requires that just like here, in defining d phi, that you have to discretize space. Right? We thought of d phi as a collection of many different phi and integrated over each of them. So similarly, to do this here, we have to also discretize momentum. Now, you probably are familiar with the fact that to discretize momentum, right, you can just periodically identify space coordinates. 
right? Once you put the particle in a periodic box, for example, right? then the momentum is automatically discretized. So instead of thinking of these space-time coordinates as going from minus infinity to infinity, right? you think of the space-time coordinates as going over a, a box of a very large volume. Okay, at the end, of course, you can take the volume to infinity. Okay, the final results will not depend on what the volume is. But you think of, so you think of space time. So take x mu as periodic coordinates. With the identification x mu is the same as x mu plus l mu. Okay, where L is the uh, length. Okay, that those will eventually take to infinity. For x zero also, we just uh, uh, assume that it's uh, uh, compact. So the easiest sort of thing uh, do this is to think of the whole thing as Euclidean. Okay. Do the analysis there, and then uh, after you have taken the limit, L goes to infinity. You rotate it back to moment the Lorentzian signature. Right. For Euclidean time, there is no confusion in uh, uh, making this periodic identity. Okay, but the details will not be important, right? So I'll, um, that's why I'm not uh, I'm in, uh, describing in detail this Euclidean versus uh, Minkowski. Just assume that this is periodically identified. Okay. In that case, KMU will be, we have the form of 2 pi S mu over L mu. <coughs> Where S mu is integral. Okay? And you recall that this x0, x1, x2, x3, okay, we had earlier taken to be delta i0, h1, i1 h2 i2 h3 i3 now i0 will no longer run over infinite number of integers okay it will be limited because i0 will now run so delta i0 is the same as delta i0 plus l mu l0 Right? Because this is our x0. Right? So, there is periodic identification by l0. So, i0 will be the same as i0 plus l0 over delta. Okay? So, you, so, physically what you have done is that you have identified time and space periodically and we have at the same time taken them as lattices. Right? Because we have discretized our uh, space time coordinate. So there are only a finite number of lattice points. Right? Once you sh go shift by a certain number of lattice points, you come back to the original lattice point. Right? And this is that number. L0 over delta is precisely the number of lattice points in that time direction. Right? Because delta is the width, the size of each lattice, uh, is, is the lattice spacing, and L0 is the total uh, distance you travel. So let's call this N0, for example. Let's call this N0. Similarly, I1 will be identified as I1 plus L1 over H1, which can call it N1, <coughs> and so on. <coughs> so using this, we can write this relation between phi tilde and phi, so let me recall again that phi tilde, phi of x, phi of x is given by integral d4k over 2 pi to d4 okay. So let us try to reinterpret this in terms of these discrete indices. Right? What does this mean? <coughs> so, 
phi i0 i1 i2 i3 okay this is a x basically stands for this this integral over momentum i'll now have to write as a sum right so that will be sum over <coughs> S0, S1, S2, S3. Well, here I am not distinguishing between upper and lower index. Since I am put upper index there, I write this way. Then, e to the power y i times minus, first one is minus k0, x0. Okay. k0 is k0 is 2 pi s mu, 2 pi s0 over l0. And then x0, x0 is delta i0. Is clear? I am just rewriting this, whatever appears here in the discrete language. Plus 2 pi s1 over l1 times h1 i1 plus the other two terms times phi tilde s0 s1 s2 <coughs> ok that's, that's this phi tilde of k But there is a p factor. Yes, the p factor is basically the lattice spacing in the k space. Okay, you have to multiply by the term, uh, lattice spacing in the in the k space, right? Because when you convert from integral to sum, okay, the lattice spacing has to be multiplied by. Okay, so lattice spacing here is two pi over l one times two pi over l two times so two pi over l. So two pi to the four over l zero. L1, L2, L3. So this, let me write one more step. 2 pi to the 4 over L0, L1, L2, L3 times <coughs> sum over S0, S1, S2, S3. You can easily check that this is exponential of minus 2 pi i times S0 i0 over n0 This is this become n zero because you see that we had delta over l zero here. Okay, delta over l zero is the number of lattice points, which is one by n zero. Yeah, that's one by n zero. Okay, l zero over delta was n zero, so delta over l zero was one over n zero. Okay, that's what I have written here. And similarly for the other. Yes, one of the signs is wrong. This is minus, right? The first one is minus. Then. Overall minus. Overall minus. So this is sometimes called a discrete Fourier transform. Right? Normally, you think of Fourier transform if it's a periodic function. The function is a continuous function, but it may be periodic, right? So you expand in Fourier modes, which is discrete sum, but the argument of the function is still continuous. Here, both the argument of the function is discrete, as well as the Fourier transform uh, argument of the Fourier transform function is discrete. Okay, so it's a discrete set of uh, quantities being related to another discrete set of quantities. So this is what is 
We weren't, uh, weren't we doing it in the Euclidean uh, time? Well, I said that you could do it in the Euclidean time, in which case it will become plus. Right? So, do, really do it carefully, you should do it in the Euclidean time and then rotate. Okay? But the, the final result doesn't really care about this. Should the 2 pi to the 4 remain? I mean, uh, in the continuum we had. The 2 pi to the 4 denominator as the normal Oh, 2 pi to the 4, yes. That's, in fact, this will go away because yeah. there is a 1 over 2 pi to the 4 already in the <laughs> here, right? So, that 2 pi to the 4 I forgot. See, this came just from the the fact that it's d4 k over 2 pi to the 4. <coughs> and in this case, so that 2 pi to the 4 basically cancels against this one. So, 2 pi to the 4 is not there, this is this one. <coughs> is okay? Okay, so this, in fact, uh, this has too much work for establishing something small, which is simply that in this language, both sides of these are ordinary integrals. Like this is product i0, i1, i2, i3, d5, i0, i1, i2, i3. Okay. This one is product s0, s1, s2, s3, d5 tilde, s0, s1, s2, s3. And the question is, how are these related? Okay, so for that, you have to figure out how are these related. Okay, because this is what defines the right hand side, this is what defines the left hand side. And the important point from here, of course, you could try to calculate the determinant. Okay, this is a linear transformation, right? From phi to phi tilde. Okay, so this is a linear change of variables. The way this is related to this is just a Jacobian of this corresponding matrix. Okay? You think of this as a big matrix okay? whose Jacobian you have to calculate. But the important point is that because it's a linear change of variables, the Jacobian is just a constant. Yeah? It doesn't depend on the field. Okay, So you can write this as j times something where j is constant. And as you have been saying, the constant factors in the path integral really don't matter because once you divide by z0, the constant factors just drop out anyway. Okay, so because it's a linear change of variables, you can you replace it by a constant and hence you can forget about it. Is this clear? Okay. So with this understanding, I will replace this phi by phi tilde. And now all reference to the original phi has gone. Right? Everything can be done with the phi tilde variables. So this tells us that z j tilde or z j, let me still call this j, is integral d phi tilde to the i s phi plus i integral j tilde minus k phi tilde of k. Well, I can write it as phi, right? but you can really express it in terms of phi tilde. Right? See, S phi, okay, if I am to write in terms of phi tilde, I have to write it as S tilde of phi tilde, where it is a different function of phi tilde, right? It's like you have, if you are changing variables, right? say f of x, if you change from x to x square, right? you don't call it f, f of x square, right? so it's a different function of x, so that's why I have kept S of phi. Okay, but of course, it's understood that S of phi will evaluate in terms of phi tilde. Sir, is there any such kind of subtlety where those kind of uh, linear transformation cannot occur and uh, maybe the j can be function of field? Uh, it's, it's well, yes. So the point is, uh, if you want to make a change of variables, right, which is not linear, right, then you have to take into account the Jacobian. 
But uh, usually uh, we are going to the momentum space and well, if you just want to go from position to momentum space, then of course it's always linear. Okay. Right? But sometimes you may want to change variables. Okay. You start from one uh, uh, action written in terms of one field, and you want to re-express in terms of another field. Okay. And that redefinition, right, if it involves nonlinear terms, then you have to keep track of the Jacobian. At okay. the lowest order, you can show that the result doesn't matter. Okay, the S matrix is the same, but at higher order, when you try to calculate the S matrix, that and uh, if, suppose you start from a theory, change variables to get another theory. Okay. You take the first one, calculate the S matrix based on that theory. You take the second one, calculate the S matrix based on that theory. Okay. You might think that okay, one is just a change of variable of the other, right? So they should give the same result. But you will typically find that they will not give the same result always. Okay, and the reason is that in that change, right, also the Jacobian has to be taken into account. Okay. If you take into account the Jacobian, then of course you expect the results to be the same. Right? Because it's the same integral written in a different variables. Okay, but without take, taking, taking into account the change in the Jacobian, you will uh, get a wrong answer. But <laughs> while going from the uh, position space variables to uh, the moment of space variables, it's always linear. Right? So there is no subtlety there. Is this clear? To change your variables is allowed because it's just ordinary integral. Okay, but you have to keep track of the Jacobian in when it's uh, not trivial. That's what you have to keep in mind. Okay, so with this, let's repeat what you had done in position space, okay. So we first calculate the free z. So also in this case, as we are taking the field integral from yes. minus infinity to plus infinity. Yes. So this uh, this j without Jacobian factor, mm. uh, while we are taking the linear uh, transformation, yes. it is not appearing in the integration limit. If it is a finite, then we have to take that. Account. That's right. Exactly. Yeah. Because here each field is like going from minus infinity to infinity, mm -hmm. right? The transform variables will also go from minus infinity to infinity, exactly. Yeah, otherwise the change, uh, uh, the end points have to be changed. Okay, so let's try to calculate z free of j. So this will be now integral d phi tilde exponential <coughs> i is of phi s you know, s let me call this i s free of phi plus i integral d four k But you have to expand this out to so d phi tilde and the minus i by two. This was the free action. Plus I integral d four k Now, you notice that here I could have written just j tilde minus k phi tilde k or j tilde k phi tilde minus k. Right? Just by k goes to minus k exchange. In fact, it's useful to combine to combine it this. It's useful to write it as half of 
sum of two terms. So one is j tilde minus k phi tilde k. The other one is j tilde k phi tilde minus k. Okay, because then you can easily square this. Okay, so I'll write down the result and then we can try to see. You agree? Right as integral d phi tilde Okay, so you have to compare what is there in the exponent here with what is there in the exponent here. First, let's look at the phi tilde, phi tilde term. Sir, uh, sir in the one second term, there will be one, only one by k square plus m square minus y epsilon. Uh, just the last line. That will be one. Uh, oh, yeah. That will be one. Uh, one, one. You can easily check that this is the same as what you had there, right? Because the phi tilde phi tilde k square plus m square minus i epsilon is what is already there. Then the cross terms here is phi tilde minus k j tilde k. Okay? Phi tilde minus k j tilde k with a minus sign. So 1 over k square plus m square minus i epsilon gets cancelled against this k square plus m square minus i epsilon and that minus sign makes this minus in k plus. Okay? So i by 2 times phi tilde minus k j tilde k. j tilde minus k phi tilde k. Okay, which is already here. The other term which is this times this okay, is very similar except that we have now have phi tilde minus k j tilde k. But as I said, that can be changed to phi tilde k j tilde minus k by k goes to minus k transpose, right? So that's the other half. So those two together give so this term. And finally, the term, the last term that comes from the product, okay, has a minus i by 2 coefficient and that gets cancelled by what I have written here. And now the idea is very similar to what we had earlier, namely that we now define this 
we define this <coughs> to be chi tilde of minus k and consequently this yes so whatever the last term the last term this one yes. oh this one comes from you take the product of these two right 1 over k square plus m square minus i epsilon whole square right one of the factors gets cancelled against k square plus m square minus i epsilon so you get a minus i by 2 1 over k square plus m square minus i epsilon and j tilde minus k j tilde k Okay. That has to be cancelled okay, by adding this term because that term was not there on the okay. left hand side. Okay, so that's the origin of this last term. <coughs> is this okay? okay? So now the idea is that we define our new variables. Okay, call this chi tilde of minus k and call this chi tilde of k. Okay. This is just a shift as far as the phi integral is concerned. This is a change of variable that corresponds to shift of phi tilde. So there, are, there is a Jacobian. Okay. So this gives you integral d chi tilde So once you have done that, this factor, okay, it's a product of this factor, this can be taken out of the integral. Okay, because this doesn't depend on chi tilde. And the chi tilde integral has no dependence on j tilde, so that's just a constant. You get this rate phi of j to be some constant. Yes, this guy will be the Fourier transform of that guy. And if you uh, go through the analysis carefully, I mean, they are, if you take that expression that we had for chi tilde of x or chi of x, okay, that chi of x will be related to this chi of chi tilde of k by Fourier transform. <coughs> Is this okay? okay? So now, given this, we can derive the Green's functions. So G tilde K1, K2. Is minus 2 pi to the 4 I delta delta J tilde of minus K1.
Okay, so you just take the derivative derivatives on this using the standard rules of delta function, and I'll leave it as an exercise to check that this gives two pi to the four minus i. minus i you can already see probably some of the signs right that this there are two factors of minus i which give a minus one. Yeah, that minus one and this minus i, <coughs> this i combined to give a minus i. Okay. It's half factor of entire because there are two derivatives. Okay. This is quadratic. So this could act on this, this could act on that, or vice versa. <coughs> the 2 pi to the 4 came because there are two factors of 2 pi to the 4 here and one 2 pi to the 4 in the denominator, right? That's what you have another extra factor of 2 pi to the 4. And the delta function, okay, you can easily check that this sets, for example, that k equal to k1. Right? And when you take the derivative of this, this sets k equal to minus k2. Right? But it's the same k that gives you delta 4 of k1 plus k2. And this you can also check that this is indeed the Fourier transform of the gx1, x2 that we had found. Okay, so of course, as I said, we could have calculated g, g tildes directly from the yeah. momentum specific lens functions, the position specific lens functions by putting a Fourier transform. Okay, are there questions? So this one I will now replace, re represent by Feynman diagram. So that will be a line as in the last case, in the earlier case. But now, of course, you are talking about momentum space in this function, it's not position space in this function. So I have to label them by momentum. And this will be the representation of the propagator. Okay. That you have a line and the momentum that the two ends carry, the delta delta j, if delta delta j tilde minus k1 and delta delta j tilde minus k2. <coughs> acts on this, I will denote the arrows towards the vortex. Okay. So if arrow towards the vortex means that you have inserted a phi tilde of k1. Right? Here you have inserted a phi tilde of k2. So two point Green's function of phi tilde k1, phi tilde k2 is this one. Is this okay? So this <laughs> represents integral d phi or d phi tilde e to the i s phi tilde k1 phi tilde k2 divided by integral d phi tilde e to the i s. Okay, so the labels k1 and k2, the momentum labels, are drawn as arrows going towards the vortex. And based on this, you can also calculate. Okay, the analysis is very similar. K1 to K2n. This will be given by G K1 K2 plus in equivalent permutations. Okay. 
Okay, again we could have derived this by Fourier transform. But you can also derive it by the explicit differentiation of this. Okay, the, the, the strategy is exactly what we had earlier that we expand the exponential in power series. Okay. And for this, you have to pick the term that contains n parts of this factor. Okay, and you differentiate and pick up the appropriate factors. <coughs> questions so now let's consider interacting theory so we calculate we have to first calculate z <coughs> of g now it's interacting theory. So this will be given now by integral d phi tilde But like what we did last time, we will take the interaction part okay, and expand it out in a power series. Okay? So e to the i interaction, e to the i s interaction, I will write as sum over n, m to 0 to infinity, 1 over m factorial, i s interaction, e for m. And inside this interaction, so this comes out, inside this interaction, every factor of phi tilde k I can replace by 2 pi to the 4 minus i delta delta j tilde of minus k. Right? Because when it acts on the rest, it will just pick up this object. Right? When the derivative acts on the exponential, it just picks up a factor i tilde of k. But the idea is that once you have written it this way, this now can be taken out of the integral. Okay, again, just as we did last time. So let me write the result and then it will become clear what we are doing here. So I can write Zj as sum over m
is this point clear because every so look at this expression for here yeah? when delta delta j tilde minus k on acts on z free of j okay z free of j is the same thing without the is interaction right it will bring down f i tilde of k this is let me put the default here over two point to be four that will become yeah right? because then this i will cancel this minus i okay and the two point to the four will cancel the one over two point to the four it will just bring down phi tilde of k so the phi tilde of k1 phi tilde of k2 phi tilde of k3 phi tilde of k4 that we had here we are just replacing by the derivatives with respect to delta delta so again this is very similar to what we did in the position space representation earlier right there's a fourier transform version of this <coughs> and then if you want to calculate g tilde k1 to kn All you have to do is that you have to insert here, insert some other factors of minus two pi to the four, minus i delta delta j tilde of minus k one. You also take put these additional derivatives because you want to now bring down also phi tilde k one after phi tilde k n, and then at the end you set j equal to zero. This k one from the different from those. Yes, this should be the different from those. So let me call this uh, p one, p one to p n. Delta four, delta four, k one plus k two plus k three plus k four. Yes. Should be inside this back or outside? Should be inside this bracket because this came from a single vortex, right? S interaction. S interaction, if you remember, had an integral of a four case, right? Phi tilde k one, phi tilde k two, phi tilde k three, phi tilde k four, and then two pi to the four delta four. K one plus K two plus K three plus K four, right? So this whole thing is just part of one single S interaction, right? And then you have to raise it to a mth power. Okay, you could have written it slightly differently because one of the K integrals you could have done using this, right? So the K four you could have replaced by minus of K one plus K two plus K three. Okay, but this is just a more symmetric way of writing this. <coughs> So what this then tells us is that the calculating the Green's function in the interacting theory, that problem gets mapped to calculating Green's function in the free theory, but with some additional vortices that you have to insert because these are the things that you have to insert additionally. But the basic structure of the calculus is exactly as we did in the free field theory. Right, the same propagators we can use. Okay, but insertions of these will correspond to inserting more vortices. So let me now write down the notation for the vortex. <coughs> so a vortex, four vortex are now level. Again, the key is always inside in into the vortex. So I'll label them as this. So what are the rules that we'll be using? Okay. The rules are just laid out from here. Okay. So first of all, there is minus i lambda by four factor here. Okay, whenever you have a vortex like this, you have minus i lambda by four factor here. Then you have integral over all the momentum that enters enters the vortex. So integral d four k one by two pi to the four. To d4 km, d4 k4 by 2 pi to the 4. 
Then there is a 2 pi to the 4, delta 4, k1 plus k2 plus k3 plus k4. <coughs> so these integrals have to, have to be done at the very end. Okay, that's like for the position space Green's function, the vortex integration over the position of the vortex had to be done at the end of everything, right? After you calculate the integral fully. So this is then the rule. Okay. And you have to remember that you have to, in order to be consistent, you have to ensure that the k's are always labeled as as if they are entering the vortex. Okay. For the phi 4 theory, it doesn't matter, okay? Because for the phi 4 theory, of course, there is no k dependence in the vortex. But later on, when we encounter vortices where there are, there, there are derivatives acting on it, <coughs> there will make a difference so that the k's are entering the vortex or coming out of the vortex, right? So this is, you have to keep in mind. Okay, that the notation is that k's will always enter the vortex. This one as well as the um, vortex that comes from outside. Okay. In terms of these rules, okay, every time there is a delta delta g of minus k, okay, that corresponds to a k that enters the vortex. Okay, whether it comes from this expansion of the interaction term or whether it comes from inserting external phi's, okay, is the same rule. Is this clear? When it happens opposite to this case? No, it never happens opposite. Yeah, what I'm saying is that here, whether you have labeled the vortex here or the opposite way, right? This is this is invariant under k goes to minus k. Right? So it would have made no difference, even if I had leveled the case in the opposite way, right? the expression of the vortex will remain the same. <coughs> but sometimes the vortex contains <coughs> derivatives. In position space, there are interactions which contains derivatives acting on fields. Right? When you go to the momentum space, those become factors of momentum. Those momentum factors, okay, once you have vortices with factors of momentum, right, then it will make a difference whether it, there is a k inserted or a minus k inserted. So there you have to be careful about these rules that, I mean, of course these rules are not sacred. You can choose any convention that you like, right? But once you have fixed a convention, you have to stick to it, right? If you use different conventions for different parts of the Feynman diagram, then you can run into problems. So when there is momentum dependence in the vortex, right, then you have to be careful about the size of the momentum that is entering the vortex, right? Whether it's k mu or minus k mu, right, is what of distinguish between. Right? And there it's important that the, the we will follow the convention that the momentum always enters the vortex. Is this clear? Okay, so with this, let's calculate some diagrams. I think we still have 10 minutes, so we can do this. So let's calculate a diagram like this, 4 point vortex, G field of A1, A2, A3, A4 at order lambda. Okay, so this, as we saw last time, this is one of the diagrams that contribute to this Green's function at order lambda. Okay. So let's label the vortex with the momentum correctly. So K1, K2, a3, A4. Here, I label this as Q1 prime, K2 prime, K3 prime, K4 prime. And next now, just write down the expression for this. So first you see that there should be four integrals because there is a vortex. Right? For all momentum entering the vortex, there is an integral. So d4 k1 <coughs> over 2 pi to the 4 <coughs> over 2 pi to the 
Pardon? Right. right, thank you. Right. Then you have to write the vortex. So minus I lambda by 4 factorial. to be 4, delta 4, okay, so this takes care of the no, vortex, then you have to write the individual propagators, 4 individual propagators, so let me write as a product, the product alpha equal to 1 to 4. So minus i 1 over k i square plus n square minus i epsilon <coughs> e alpha plus k alpha prime. That was the propagated expression. Right? G Q1 K2 that you had found. Right? G2 Q1 K2, that's this propagator. Right? That's the result. So the, that's the free field theory result we are using is that the result is just the proper pro product of propagators. Right? That's that was the free field theory result. Right? And that's what you are using to calculate the interacting field theory result. Okay, where the effect of the interaction in this case is this vortex with these integrals. And then, of course, there is combinatorial factor, <coughs> which so that something is the same as what we had done earlier. Yes. Any question? Well, the full integral, <coughs> right, from minus infinity to infinity, because that these momentum integrals came from Fourier transform, right? So you take full minus infinity to infinity. Right. If you are doing this, the, the discrete version, right, then of course we have some over uh, momentum over a finite range. But once you have gone to the infinite space and in, uh, uh, no lattice, then all integrals go, go back to minus infinity. Right. Yes. Uh, what is the so this, of course, there is a lot of simplification you can already see. Right. Because many of these momentum integrals, all these k prime integrals, Okay, can be done with the help of these data functions. Okay. That just says k prime to k or k prime to minus k. Okay. So I can write this as minus i lambda over 4 factorial Is this clear? So, the rules that we derived, okay, of course, you can always use those, okay, but it's just that those are not very efficient because of these many integrals and many 2 pi to the 4 factors. Right, in the numerator and denominator, which eventually cancel. Okay. By, but just from these rules, we can try to derive a simplified set of rules, okay, which are as follows. It's a simplified set of rules. Okay. So in this, the vortex 
this minus i lambda over 4 factorial, the combinatoric factors, they are all the same. Okay, so there is no change in that. I'll just give the rules for how to organize these momentum integrals. So, first that for every connected component, for every connected component, We have two pi to the four <coughs> delta four sum over incoming momentum or outgoing momentum. It doesn't matter. Okay, here in this diagram, this whole thing is connected, right? So that's what would be responsible for this one. Okay, two pi to the four delta four plus k two plus k two plus k. The second component is that they implement implement momentum conservation. Which means that here I wrote this is k1 k1 prime, right? I should have written this k1 minus k1. Okay. Similarly, k3 minus k3. Okay. We, because, because of this delta function in the propagator, we don't we know that these are the same. Here is minus k1 minus k2 minus k3, right? This one I could have replaced minus k4 by uh, the negative of the sum of the three. But of course, eventually you have a delta function, right? So here it doesn't matter whether you write minus k4 or minus of k1 plus k2 plus k3. Okay, it's the same. The third. step is that after you have done this, okay, after step 2, after step 2, for every undetermined momentum, So these rules basically come from the fact that whenever there is a k integral, there is a 2 pi to the 4 in the denominator. Right? Whenever there is a delta function, there is 2 pi to the 4 multiplying the delta function. Right? So when you do a k prime integral or k integral using the delta function, 2 pi to the 4 just cancel. Okay? And the result is just impl implementing momentum conservation. Okay? So that's why the 2 pi to the 4 factors automatically cancel. The only time when the two pi to the factors remain is when there is a delta function that is left over. Okay, that will be always multiplied by two pi to the four, or when there is a momentum integration that is left over, that will be multiplied by accompanied by one over two pi to the four. <coughs> okay, so let me just give an example of these rules. Okay, and then maybe it will become clearer. Okay, but you can also try to work out the same example from the first principles and verify that indeed we get the correct result. So let's consider this diagram. This is again four point Green's function but at order lambda square. Okay, so call this k1, k2, k3, k4. So 
So let's label the momentum. So this is minus k1, minus k2. Now you see that in this line, okay, the momentum that flows along this line is not determined by any conservation law. Okay, so we'll call this some momentum L. Direction L from this one. But once this is carrying momentum L, this one is fixed. This is minus k1, minus k2, minus L. Because minus k1 plus minus k2 come in total, L flows out. Right? So what flows here must be negative of minus k1 minus k2 minus L. Right? That's the momentum. And then you can also check that at this vortex momentum is conserved. So the total momentum that is entering is L from here minus k2 minus k2 k1 minus k2 minus L. So total minus k1 minus k2 comes from the left and minus k3 minus k4 comes from the right. The total momentum that is entering this vortex is minus k1 minus k2 minus k3 minus k4. But that of course will be set to 0 because it will be multiplied by this 2 pi to the 4 delta 4 k1 plus k2 plus k1 plus k4. So now we can write down the expression for this vortex. So it will be d4 l over 2 pi to the 4 because l is undetermined. Okay, So you have to integrate over this. And then we put 2 pi to the 4 delta 4 k1 plus k2 plus k3 plus k4 okay. that's because again there is only one connected component okay. so you have just sum of our four momentum then you have the product of all the propagators vortices so minus so 1 over 2 factorial because there are two vortices, okay. minus i lambda over 4 factorial square, okay. one from each, and then we have product over alpha, if you want to 1 to 4, minus i over 2. and then these two propagators. So minus i over l square plus m square minus i epsilon and minus i over <coughs> times common to Is this rule clear? Why is there a 1 by 2 factor? That is because there are two vortices. Right? So when you expanded that into the IS interaction, right? It's 1 over 2 factorial times S interaction square. So that's that says 1 over 2 factorial. Okay. So I'll leave it as an exercise. Is to compare this. with first principle result which is which basically means that you have now four integrals coming from here four integrals coming from here right, from each vortex and then in the propagators there are delta functions right, using all those you can show that you eventually get this Okay, basically you have to just integrate some of the momentum out okay, using the delta functions. A slightly non-trivial exercise will be to drive this from the position space expression.
last time we wrote down the expression for gx1, x2, x3, x4, right? For the same diagram, right? You remember there is a delta xy square and we are integrals over x and y. So that, if you start from there and take Fourier transform, right, you should get this. Right? So this is something you can try to verify. It's a little more complicated, but it certainly is doable. Right? Basically, every function of x that you get there, you have to write in, its, in terms of its Fourier transform. Right? And then do the x integrals explicitly. Oh, first question, well, it's a somewhat trivial question, which is that if you just take this vortex, yeah. it is earlier the Feynman rules that we gave, right? That for each vortex, you would have written just k1, k1 prime, right? And there will be integral d4 k1 prime, d4 k2 prime, d4 k3 prime, d4 k4 prime, right? Similarly, there are four integrals from here, right? And then for each of these propagators, there will be some delta functions, right? So that first question is just to show that when you start from that expression, and carry out some of the momentum integrals using these delta functions, you actually arrive at this expression over here. Is this okay? This is actually following those rules. Yes, exactly. So uh, I said that from those rules, these follow, right? This is just to uh, explicitly verify that indeed those rules, right? At least for this diagram, those rules do give the same result as these rules. Okay, so next week the classes will be uh, changed a little, well not a little, maybe by a lot, but I'll send out a mail sometime in the afternoon today.